So yeah, the uh, prelim solutions are here, not yet. The graded ones are not here yet. They'll be handed out Monday, but the solutions are here. So you're coming in, you can pick it up. <coughs> All right, so let's see. I just wanted to spend a few minutes uh, with the prelim questions. I, uh, we are just about start, starting to grade it today, so we'll have it for you ready on Monday. Um, uh, but uh, uh, let's see. I'll start with problem two. Problem two. We'll discuss a bit on problem three, and then the first problem, which is uh, the reason for that is the topics we're going to cover today in the class after discussing the exam, we're going to start with something that takes off from problem one, which is, you know, the ratio between spontaneous stimulated emission and so on. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, so let's see, problem two was uh, uh, about the internal loss of uh, a laser and, uh, uh, yep. Uh, is it possible to do problem one with this person, um, solving you could solve it in any way you like. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll come back to that. We'll discuss that. Let's start with two, three, and then. So problem two, uh, was the problem statement uh, clear so that you have a laser with two mirrors, and one of them has a reflectivity of one. And what you're trying to do here is trying to figure out what is the internal loss uh, of the laser, right? And the way you're trying to do that is uh, uh, you, you um, essentially uh, have the second mirror. Uh, you use one first with a certain reflectivity. And you measure how much power, uh, rather, what is the threshold for lasing. Um, and you replace it with something else. And uh, the threshold for lasing changes. Okay. Uh, Right, and from there you can calculate what this alpha is. So, so that's a technique that's typically used in lasers. Uh, and uh, um, uh, let me see, any questions on, on this? Because I, um, I have the ha solutions handed out today, but uh, let me see, was it clear at least what was the question? Or, yeah. Hmm. No? Yeah, so uh, let's see, I mean, um, for any uh, such problem, I think, I think you know that the threshold for lasing is reached when the gain becomes equal to loss, right? And, and, and the total gain uh, uh, and, and, and loss, basically g gamma is the gain in inverse centimeter and alpha is the loss in inverse centimeter. Then uh, you th I think you know that uh, uh, alpha, let's, uh, so, so e to the power, you know, gamma minus alpha times the total effective length is equal to one is the, is the lasing criteria, right? Uh, for, for the whole, you know, um, for the whole thing, if, if, if you had no losses and all that, but if you have losses in the reflectivities of mirrors, I think you, you know that we added reflectivity of one, two, or transmission, whatever you have, you just keep adding them and the total thing should be one, right? Okay. So this alpha is the internal loss, meaning loss inside here, not in the mirrors, but internal loss. And, and from here, uh, uh, the, um, the other thing here is that the gain is proportional to 
uh, you know, sigma times your n2 minus n1. And ba basically, the total number of populated, uh, population inverted uh, uh, atoms is equal to, is proportional to the threshold. You, can, you don't have to write equal, but it's proportional to the threshold power because photon energy times the number of atoms, the uh, number of states times, uh, you know, divided by some lifetime is the threshold power, right? So, so this is proportional to the threshold power. And that re that's all you kind of need for this problem. Uh, that the trick here is the L remains same when you change the reflectivity of R2. Alpha remains same, internal losses do not change. But this thing changes from P threshold to P threshold prime, and R2 changes from R2 to R2 prime. So you get basically two equations, and you can solve it then, uh, to get the alpha. So that was the problem. So essentially, you can you know, turn this around, and uh, uh, R2, R1 is 1, so, and then you divide it by your 2L and all that. Sorry, the two times that. So two uh, round trip is two L, and uh, so what I'm saying is you have gamma one for R R two one, you know, gamma one, and then you have gamma prime minus alpha is one over two L R two prime. So you know, so, yeah. So so solving these two, uh, and and we are saying that this is some constant times the threshold power, right? Some constant times the threshold power, both of them. This is the same constant times threshold power prime. So now you're given these two, given these two, eliminate this, don't need it, and you get alpha. Right? So, right? so, so I just want to first uh, ask uh, was the question clear? And yeah, okay. And, uh, what are the concerns or you know if, if there are any doubts or questions about this I, I want to maybe spend a couple of minutes addressing them or what if there are conceptual problems here it was not some some concept some sim, something that I just mentioned was not very clear I just want to address that first and we can spend some time discussing about those things in coming classes as well yeah I guess when I was going over the loss <coughs> coefficient, I never saw them both in the same formula. Like I never saw a gain coefficient minus a loss coefficient. It was either a gain co coefficient or a loss coefficient. It was like it wasn't like both. And th so I get like the gain coefficient would come from like the gain itself to the population inversion. But what exactly would the loss coefficient be in this case? Oh, the last coefficient? Uh, so, for example, let's say I have, let's assume, I mean, for simplicity here, the entire thing is a gain medium. Then uh, uh, you, you create your, you know, population inversion from your atoms that give you the gain, right? But then there, these atoms could be sitting in a solid. Uh, if you look at a ruby laser, um, there could be other types of atoms. And this, these atoms, the excited atoms could collide with them and lose their energy to non-radiative processes without emitting a photon. And those are all sources of loss. For example, crystal vibration, all kinds of other things. And alpha is uh, uh, typically, in, um, well, not typically. Alpha is a measure of all those losses combined. All those losses combined. And I think, uh, uh, let me see, w which class? In the review class, we did talk about alpha a little bit. So there are two ways of. Looking at alpha, uh, one is ob the obvious ones, which is the reflectivity of the mirrors, etc. But internal losses are because of these physical reasons that I mentioned. That all processes that lead to non-radiative loss of energy, you know, if this it emits a photon, that's useful. That helps in stimulated emission. But it may collide with other atoms in the crystal and or other gases and, and lose it in exciting them, heating them up rather than ex emitting a photon. These are all non-radiative processes. So that's alpha, that's a measure of all those other radi non-radiative processes. So uh, let me see, so uh, it's po possible, uh, as you know, if I remember in the last couple, couple of classes before the exam uh, and also in the review, I just mentioned it, but perhaps it was not emphasized enough, but may maybe I'll keep that in mind. And, 
try to emphasize this a bit more in the next time. Any other question? Yeah. We never talked about threshold. I was always threshold population, like, uh -huh. and so that connection with like power and like whatever was not that clear. K is I don't. I feel like I've never seen that, or at least it was okay. never emphasized that that was important at all. Oh, well, it is clearly important. Yeah, sure, sure. So I understand. Okay, so um, uh, let's see. So that's. Uh, um, it's the first laser score, so I, I, I think we, uh, the, let me see. So we did calculate uh, um, the threshold power in class in a couple of examples with Cliff, and I think I did, and then there were a couple of assignment problems, but it maybe skipped, was not emphasized enough is what you mean. So we'll, you know, keep, keep so, so threshold power is when you know what is your threshold uh, carrier density or you know n2 minus n1 has to reach a certain threshold to overcome the loss and that means that times photon energy over a lifetime is is your threshold power uh, uh, you know energy over time so that's that so essentially whenever you know your threshold carrier density you know your threshold power is related directly to the photon energy times the threshold carrier density divided by a like decay lifetime you know. so number Threshold number is related to uh, threshold power this way, and uh, I think the qu question here uh, gave you the threshold powers uh, with the intention that we kind of make make this connection right away, you know, so physically at least. So, yeah. so um, okay, so we'll try to emphasize this point as well in the next few problems, uh, next few topics we cover, and these these will be. Uh, I'm saying, I mean, I, I think it. Many of these uh, uh, to topics need emphasis throughout the course, and the next topic, the next major topic in this course, is semiconductor lasers, and we will calculate a lot of that, a lot of that, in, uh, so it will hopefully get more emphasized uh, if it hasn't been yet to now. So, Any other questions? Okay, so the last question was uh, the question three was uh, measuring the uh, sorry the photon lifetime and population inversion. Uh, let's see what was that way. So it, that, it had a ring laser cavity. And a neodymium YAG ring laser of total length 10 centimeters. So, and you have three meters. Right. And a gain medium. So. Let's see. Oh, yeah. And how I labeled it R1, R2, R3. And that's uh, D, a one centimeter, and the total length L here is 10 centimeters, right? That's what it's given. And uh, okay, the reflectivities are given, and the uh, gain cross, uh, the, the cross section. Is given as well. I don't want to write the numbers. 2.8 then to a minus 19 centimeters square. Sir, yep. You say D is the entire length and that is LG. Oh, good point. Right, right. LG is the gain medium and D is the entire length. Okay, right. So, all right. So let's just uh, write that. that's D. You know. uh, now, uh, neglect all internal cavity losses and assume a stimulated emission cross section this much at the center frequency of the laser and calculate analytically the photon lifetime when there is no pumping. Right? So, uh, was that clear or that something? Uh, so photon lifetime is, uh, if you remember, uh, what, I mean the concept of the photon lifetime is I have a certain number of photons inside the cavity and how am I losing them, right? That, that's, how, that's how you calculate the lifetime, right? so The number of photons, how am I losing them? Well, if, if my blob of photons starts out here, let's say, I go this way, this way, this way, this way, come back this way. So I lost some, lost some, gained some, lost some, lost, you know, came back, right? You do the full round trip, add them all up, and you get a, uh, so if I started here, 
the first uh, hit I make, uh, to the, uh, first bounce of the first mirror, you lose R, R2, then you lose R3, or rather, I mean, that's how much is left in some sense, and then you uh, gain e to the power gamma times Lg, right? E to gamma, gamma is the uh, coefficient, so gamma times Lg. Now, gamma is not given, but that's given, right? Cross section is given. And I and, uh, think uh, the gain coefficient is the cross section times uh, n2 minus n1, right? Where n2 minus n1 is uh, uh, population inversion for you, and this is the cross section. And let me just write that part down. So you get n2 minus n1 times the length of the gain medium. Then you mo keep moving, lose r1, and come back here. So R1, and then you come back there. So that's your total fraction of photons that are left here. Uh, if you started with 100, and if this quantity turns out to be 0.98, then you have 98% left. You have lost two photons, right? So, uh, uh, so every round trip, that's what happens. And so you can write it as uh, you know, how many photons are left in a round trip is 1 minus this whole big thing here times how many you started with divided by the round trip time right that's that's how that's your differential equation really and so what i wanted to mention was uh, uh, this whole quantity one over you know it, it is equal to one over the li you know the the photon lifetime right or in other words the photon lifetime is equal to the round trip travel time divided by this whole whole big thing here R2, R3, uh, Lg. And what is the round trip time? I mean, that's uh, hopefully clear that we have the total distance is d, but then out of which Lg is a different material medium. So really, it's d plus times uh, the gain medium over, or rather, sorry. C, speed of light divided by whole thing is equal to the round trip travel time. That's e e easy, right? D minus LG plus, you know, because it takes a little longer for light to get through here, so your refractive index N. So that, that thing will come in here, and then so we can. Well, did I write it correctly? Sorry. <laughs> Over C. That time, so yeah, n minus one Lg over C times whole thing. So that's your answer for actually all parts of the, I mean, first part and the second part. Now you can plug in the values. The first question, first part is saying when there's no pumping at all. When there's no pumping, what's going on? What is n two minus n one? When you're not pumping it at all, pretty much all atoms are sitting in n one, right? And N2 is very small, N1 is huge. What does that mean? This is very large and negative, right? Is, it, is that clear? Very large and negative. And e to the power, a very large and negative number is basically zero, right? And you recover your round trip phase in a time as if there was no gain medium at all, right? I mean, that's the photon lifetime, as if there's no gain medium. And that's, that's how it should be if you don't have gain. And only when you start pumping it, you reach uh, a certain value when it's half the threshold. And I think, uh, you know, when you are reaching half the threshold, e to the power, whatever is sitting here, times all the other losses, which are R1, R2, and R3, right? When you are full threshold, this is one, right? When you are at threshold. But if you have pumped it just at half the threshold, this thing is half of that value. So what does, what does that mean? Square root of that thing is one. You know? so, so you get half threshold is one over square root of this thing, R2, R3. You know, that, that's really, uh, and then from there, you can uh, 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 essentially, what it means is this thing is really just uh, one over square root of R1, R2, R3. So this thing cancels with, you just get a square root of R1, R2, R3 in the denominator here, right? Uh, and, and then you can evaluate what is the uh, photon lifetime. 
I think uh, when I plug in the numbers for the first part, I'm getting five uh, nanoseconds. And at a half threshold, I'm getting 10 nanoseconds is the photon lifetime. What will be the photon lifetime when I go to full threshold? It'll actually blow up. You know, this will become, you know, this times that will become one. That's threshold, right? And so photon lifetime effectively blows up. Physically, what it means is it's not, you know, not, it's not like it's, light is trapped inside. I mean, there's always a, a certain amount of light inside now because the material has gained. You're replenishing it every time. So you're not losing photons anymore. So it takes infinite time for it to decay. And the population inversion reach, re required to reach that threshold, I, I think that's, uh, you know, this, this quantity here, delta N times uh, the cross section is the gain times, remember this is a single pass, it's not double pass, so it's just a single pass in a round trip, right? It's a ring laser. So instead of two here, we use only one, right? And, and that uh, gain is equal to loss again, so R1, R2, R3, and so for threshold, sorry, for threshold, this whole quantity, this times that is equal to one. So from here, you can easily calculate what this thing, because everything else is given to you. Right. And so in other words, the population inversion threshold is one over sigma LG, natural log of all these reflectivities, R2 and R3. Right. So. So, let me stop here again and ask, uh, what, what, what was this clear or were there any conceptual problems with this problem? This is quite similar to many of the questions where you had solved, I think, in the assignments and also, you know. Or, is it's okay? Okay, so uh, let's go go back to the first question, and this was, uh, uh, say, you know, about uh, stimulated and spontaneous em emission becoming equal uh, at a certain temperature of a black body, and uh, and uh, I think we had uh, the picture that uh, problem one. And I want to start, you know, finish with this discussion uh, about the exam. Uh, so uh, just to remind ourselves, uh, if I have this atomic situation uh, with n2 atoms in the excited state and n1 in the ground state, uh, you have the three processes out of which we are talking about two now. We are talking about the spontaneous emission and the stimulated emission. Right. So you have a rate of decay. I'm going to write it down again because we're going to use it uh, today in the class. Okay. Uh, times uh, N2 times the photon field stimulated emission and plus uh, B12 N1 times the photon field is the absorption. Right. So it's probably the, I, I've, I've emphasized the, the most important equation in this course. You know, I mean, uh, and it is uh, uh, hopefully very it should be clear what, what it means, all these terms, right? And, and here in this question, what we are asking uh, is, is here's my spontaneous emission rate, here's a simulated emission rate. I'm saying in this situation, I have a black body that's radiating, and I have somehow managed to measure out here these two rates individually, and I find they're exactly equal. Okay. So, so, uh, so the question is, what, what is the temperature at which this body is sitting at, right? That, that was the question. And uh, that means uh, clearly A21 times N2 is equal to B21 times N2 times the photon field, right? If, if the two rates are equal. And, and, uh, and, and therefore this goes away and we are left with A21 over B21 is equal to the photon field or the radiation field, radiation pattern and that we know. That's Planck's, you know, black body formula, right? Planck's black body formula, which, uh, uh, you know, looks like all the um, C cube, the photon uh, density here times, oh, sorry, yeah, N cube times nu squared, 
Okay, t minus one, right? So that's the thing. And uh, and what is a to one over b to one? Do we know this? Actually, we know this as well. You can you know uh, go back in the derivation of all this stuff. That happens to be, interestingly, exactly this. A to one and b to one are exactly related by that ratio. So that whole thing is sitting here, and they are equal. Therefore, e one over e to the power h nu over k t minus one must be equal to one. Okay, and then from here you get that your, well, h nu over k t is equal to two. Therefore. I'm just going to write through this is equal to natural log of two. So therefore, temperature of the black body is photon energy over Boltzmann constant times natural log of two. Right? So, so that's that's that. Yeah. And uh, uh, now a two and b two one are spontaneous and stimulated emission coefficients, and they are related by this. Uh, it's a very important result, actually. And uh, just to simplify it, you can remember it much. And this formula appears somewhere in your book a couple of times. I forget in the chapter eight and others. Uh, and and that that you know, if you look at c over n, this that's wavelength. Uh, uh, c over you know, this whole thing. So uh, good way to kind of uh, remember is it's uh, eight pi h Planck's constant, eight pi times Planck's constant by cube of the wavelength. That's that's a to one by b to one for all wavelength for any wavelength. So. <clears throat> okay, so that's that. So any questions on this this one, or any fundamental issues or concerns? Anything was not clear, or was not emphasized, which made you miss what you know what we could have used? Okay, none. Good. Okay, so. So we'll actually start from here, uh, and I, I, I mentioned earlier, I'll hand, we, we'll finish grading and hand, hand back the exams on Monday uh, in, the, in the class. And for the rest of the class today, I wanna uh, 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 kind of s finish up uh, the discussion that Professor Rana started in uh, the last class, and that was uh, on, sorry, where is me? Yeah, on, on uh, various kinds of lasers, but uh, really the f uh, one of the topics I wanted to uh, link with this problem is, uh, uh, is what's called broadband or you know, uh, gain over a very large range of wavelengths or large spectrum. And uh, I think this is not very clear, but we are just to kind of calibrate ourselves. Uh, Professor Rana talked quite a bit about, uh, so we're done with that. We're talking about ch in chapter 10 now, he talked about you know, erbium doped fiber amplifiers. So this chapter has a survey of many kinds of lasers. I mean, many kinds of, uh, so uh, lasers which uh, show you some are three levels, some are four levels, some are broadband, and we are talk, going to talk about broadband a little bit now. Uh, you talked a bit about ruby lasers, rare earth, TISAFs, and today we are going to first talk about just the idea of the broadband optical gain, and then look into tunable lasers, and. Uh, you know, the survey of some gas discharge lasers, excimers, and free electron lasers. I mean, I'm not going to go too deep into any of them. This is a chapter for you to read and, you know, look at various kinds uh, of lasers. Uh, they're all applications of what we have done till now, except the free electron laser. That's a new one. We haven't talked anything about what the free electron laser, how it works. For all the others, the physics or the, the, the you know, uh, science behind it, we have covered in general in this course. So. Okay, so uh, let's uh, look at broadband gain, and I'm again. Uh, this is a topic we're going to cover in very, uh, uh, very deep in a deep detail when we talk about semiconductors, uh, starting Monday, uh, about semiconductor lasers. But uh, the idea here is, uh, you know, this picture of energy states allowed for atoms. I think you kind of already see in uh, uh, some of the uh, lasers that you talked about that they actually are sometimes quite a few levels here. It's not just like one or two levels. There are you know, atoms or gases with lots of energy levels. And so uh, uh, whenever you have that situation, uh, uh, I think one has to realize right away that I can have a, a photon being emitted with the same energy because of maybe a transition like that or uh, um, okay, let's, let's say this is, this, these are all the energies allowed. So I can have a transition like that. I can have a transition 
like that, I can have a transition like that, they're all giving me the same photon, I mean same energy of the photon, right? if they're equally spaced here, the way I'm drawing. Okay? So I can have the same photon coming out uh, because of a transition that had very different origins, you know, one from here to there, one from here to there or something. There are many possibilities lead to the same photon in the end. Right? And this is going to happen in a very big way in semiconductor lasers, you know, because you have this huge density of states in semiconductor uh, um, systems and, and uh, many excitations, many transitions can give you the same photon. You know? And so, uh, and we play very carefully, uh, engineer very carefully the semiconductor laser to make sure that you know, we, we get the best performance by playing with this, this game. So a very simple idea here, which I want to emphasize at this point and then kind of move on uh, and we'll come back to this in the semiconductor lasers, is how does this picture change that, you know, you had the Einstein AB coefficient, A and B were related through this nice relationship and this is all nice and fine if you have single, I mean, just two states and one, at, you know, E2 and one at E1. Now what happens if I have many, right? That's, that's the question we're trying to address now. And if you have many, uh, so let's say here's the E2 state we are interested in and here's the E1 state. At thermal equilibrium, you know, these states, there are electrons in the states uh, and uh, their, their occupation function is determined by Fermi Dirac distribution. But uh, if we are, if our Fermi level is somewhere down there, it's the tail of the Fermi Dirac distribution, which is the Bo Maxwell Boltzmann or the Boltzmann tail, right? So essentially, what the, what, what the statement we are saying is the probability of occupation of all these energy states. These are energies. Is is uh, you know typically a Fermi function because electrons are fermions, so they follow Fermi Dirac distribution. They have a certain Fermi level, and then the electron distribution goes like that. Uh, let's uh, write that down. Uh, for any fermion, the, uh, the probability of occupation, let's write it as F because that's a more, we're going to use this notation in the class uh, later for semiconductors. E minus EF over KT, where EF is the Fermi energy of this problem. And exactly at EF, you have half. You know, because uh, E and EF become equal, e to the power zero is one, so you get half. But we are looking at atomic system, all these energies are kind of way out here, you know, up there, right? The Fermi level is somewhere down there. So we are looking at uh, uh, from, uh, this bo a tail where E minus EF is much larger than KT, and E minus EF, if it is, uh, energy is much larger than the Fermi energy, And, and therefore you can, you know, if e to the power of a large positive number, you can forget the one, and you get e to the power minus EF over KT, right? So, so, so that's kind of the uh, approximation, uh, the Maxwell-Boltzmann approximation. And so all, all that it means is you have the probability function kind of decaying at like an exponential. And uh, so now how does this simple picture of uh, of uh, you know Einstein uh, relation. Remember here the relation was n2 over n1 is e to the power minus e2 minus e1 over kt. Right? That helped us get to the Planck black body radiation formula. That's thermal equilibrium criteria. Uh, and the question here is how does that get modified? And let me just start by saying that not much. You just have to be a little careful with uh, uh, you know which a, a, a B coefficients we are looking at here, because for each transition, for a transition from this state E1, or rather let's say this state in E2, I know it's labeled E1, from this state to that state, has one A coefficient and one B coefficient, right? E2 to E1. But if I go to another energy state here, another energy state here with the same exact energy of transition, they can have slightly different A1 and B2, A2 and B2. They can have slightly different, yeah. depending upon the wave functions, the orbital shapes, and all that. They can have slightly different. But the beautiful thing is the ratio is not going to change. The ratio is always the same. You know that's an important thing. Meaning, uh, when I generalize it to many states, I'm saying that I have transitions from here to here, and then maybe I have transition from here to there. They have the exact same photon energy. Uh, what I wrote here, you know, all I have to make sure is I, I treat 
take into account which state I'm looking at. So the individual A's and B's may be different for different states, but the ratio is always that. So that, that's, that, that, that's in, and it depends on the wavelength of the photon energy. So if you are at a very short wavelength, UV or you know, X-ray or whatever, very, very short wavelength, then uh, uh, from here it's pretty clear that this is a very large number, therefore you, know, uh, you, you, you have much larger, in some sense, uh, uh, absorption, uh, or rather, sorry, much larger spontaneous than stimulated and all that depends on the wavelength here. Okay. So that's the major change, and then uh, there are some other details here, uh, uh, which I will come back to when we talk about semiconductors. The, uh, if you start from here and you track through, uh, here's our rate equation under DC, steady state. So essentially what we're saying is all these coefficients now become dependent on which energy state you're really looking at, E2 and E1, from this manifold and that manifold. These are basically the bunches of energies we're going to call manifolds of energies within that I have this transition giving me, say, a green photon, that transition also giving me green photon, that also giving me green photon, so I have many possibilities now. Right? Uh, and and uh, uh, so now, uh, you know, the, the, the entire equation now becomes something like this, uh, uh, very similar to what you had earlier, but there's a degeneracies and all now uh, play a role. And when you take that and you equate, uh, and then from here, if you remember the method to find out the a and B coefficients is, is, is you can make the connection that uh, the photon field that you have here is exactly equal to the Planck's black body distribution formula and from there you get your A's and B's and their ratios, right? That's how you get that, uh, those ratios. And when you do that here, you get uh, uh, a slightly different sort of a gain equation, okay? And then I'll, I'll just write that down and you know, just a quick introduction to this idea. Right? So the, uh, the gain coefficient used to be times N2 minus N1, right? That used to be our gain coefficient, the absorption cross-section times N2 minus N1. To be more accurate, you know, you, you had, if you had degeneracies, uh, if you had G2 states for N2 and G1 states for N1, this was a little bit more accurate. But now it changes to something that looks like what's uh, written here, uh, and then let me just write that down. And then uh, again, fundamentally we have not changed anything except because of the various states available, the equation looks slightly different, that's all. I mean, the, so, and, and we define two quantities now. Instead of just one cross-section, we have one for emission and one for absorption. So absorption cross-section and emission cross-section. So we're gonna talk about that, yeah. Yeah. And it was just Right. So this this what we are going to see now is uh, the the ratio of the emission and the absorption coefficient here will. All right. So let me uh, write write that down. Absorption coefficient. I'm going to derive this in uh, greater detail and hopefully a little more physical connection in the next class when we talk about semiconductors, but so, so under thermal equilibrium, the absorption and emission coefficients will be related like this, which uh, means that uh, uh, at, if I don't do, if, it, if I don't excite my system, if I don't, if I leave my system under thermal equilibrium, be it a gain medium, be it a semiconductor, PN diode, whichever be it, it will always absorb more than it will emit. You will not get photons for free here. You know, and that's what it's going to mean uh, very soon, we'll see. And the reason for that is there are always more atoms sitting in the bottom than on the top. And that's, that's really what gives you this very interesting result. And what we'll see is uh, uh, if you pull the system out of equilibrium by injecting current or shining light externally, then you move this away and this is, we're going to just call it as an epsilon. We're going to, uh, uh, so the, the only chance you have uh, uh, with, with the for the material to emit light is if you, if you, if you actually uh, excite it, you know, and if, you, if you pull it out of equilibrium, and this is the non-equilibrium parameter. We're going to derive this in great detail uh, in the next class. Okay. Uh, so uh, there's, a, there's this difference uh, uh, between the, how absorption coefficient and emission coefficients are defined. 
And that really is related to how many states you have in the bottom and on the top. And as you excite it, you can see now if I can inject more carriers into this, this little manifold and pull out some carriers from this manifold, I get more states here and less states here. And that, in a semiconductor parlance, that's electrons and that's holes. You have created holes here and electrons there. In this sense. But this happens in atomic systems too. It's not necessarily restricted to semiconductors. Uh, and, and, and now uh, you can have the gain, uh, or, or rather, you can have uh, under uh, uh, certain situations when this excitation exceeds the photon energy, H nu, uh, you can have more emission than absorption. This becomes less than one now. So you have more emission, and that's the LED, you know, the light emitting diode, where you apply a little voltage and it really emits photons rather than just absorbing photons, it starts emitting. And then you push it even further, and then you get population inversion, and you get lasing. So, so, so the, uh, it depends on how far you go out of equilibrium, uh, it, you can get lasing. So that's kind of general thing I wanted to mention, uh, uh, that uh, the idea of lasing carries over, but with slight tweaks on what we had defined earlier an absorption co coefficient and emission coefficient, which we are going to derive in great detail for semiconductors. So I'm going to just leave it there and not go further today. Okay, so uh, I think oh, that's the equation. Absorption coefficient divided by emission coefficient is e to the power photon energy minus this little parameter that measures how far out of equilibrium you are by kt. So, and, and that will kind of hopefully very and nicely clarify uh, the regimes of operation. A semiconductor lying without any voltage is just absorbing photons, but also, you know, mostly absorbing photons, not emitting much. Apply a little voltage, and you start, emit, em start emitting photons under certain condition, and then you apply even more, reach threshold, over gain overcomes loss, and then you can laze. So. Okay, so. Uh, uh, so I'm just going to go through a couple of topics here, uh, which are various kinds of lasers, continuing that discussion. Uh, uh, one is uh, this uh, topic of a dye laser, and this is a good example of manifolds uh, or, or continuous you know, uh, density of states that appear, many of them. Right? Right. Instead of just single states here, you have many of them. And the way uh, uh, this happens is, is, is you First of all, why do you need it? And I think uh, uh, Sarana also had mentioned in the last class roughly that uh, for some applications you need a broad band, uh, you need uh, lasing over a large uh, range of energies, large uh, frequencies, a range of frequencies. So here's my frequency. I can have either uh, extremely sharp lasing, uh, you know, a center frequency and I can have very narrow bandwidth or I can have you know, something like that. Right? This is a broad, broader band. And uh, for some applications, the broadband is nice, especially if you are making like a mode lock laser or something like that, then you can have many modes inside it and you can lock many of them and increase the power per pulse by a large amount. You know, so this is a good example. Or some other applications where the broadband may be useful. And the way you get the broadband is you choose a molecule instead of an atom, which is, you know, typically very discrete states. What you choose is a molecule, like a big molecule, which is an organic dye, uh, uh, you know, rhodamine or something like that, very large molecule. Uh, and the molecule, in addition to its atomic, you know, uh, orbital states, it has also these vibrational energies. It can stretch, it can rotate, it has all these other vibrational energies as well. So uh, what you see here, at least uh, qualitatively, is you have one state which is because of its, uh, you know, maybe well, you have many vibrational energy, and the, and the vibrational energies are typically much smaller than the uh, orbital energy differences, meaning I have, say, s orbital energy here, uh, another, the 1s and maybe 2s state or something like that uh, above here, and then within the 1s state, the molecule can rotate, stretch, vibrate, and all these energies are measures of that. You know? Am I stretching, rotating? So these are small energy scales, typically in millielectron volts, whereas that is in electron volts. Right. So you get a continuum of these little energies, a continuum of these little energies. This is not a solid, this is a dye molecule in a certain solution, and, but the transitions now can happen over a very large range. That's the idea. So it can absorb over a, 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 a band of energies, this is in wavelength, and it emits over a band of energies, you know, emits at a shorter wavelength or larger, emits at a longer wavelength. Then, uh, so it absorbs here 
and then it relaxes because of vibrational relaxations and then it you know emits by transitioning from here to here and then relaxes again so you can you know here's your kind of a four level system if you might you pump relax very fast slow and this is like uh, very fast and then you re regenerate it again and again so so that's the four level laser and you're getting the broadband because of the vibrational modes it's a large molecule it's heavy it has you know uh, uh, whenever you have a heavy mass uh, uh, I think uh, all these classical notions carry over. If I have spring constant and mass, the frequency of vibration is square root of uh, k over m. I think you know that. So mass is heavy, then frequency is small, and h bar omega is the energy scale of vibration. The energy is very small. So you have small energy excitations. So heavy molecules, the large molecules have all these uh, very nice, uh, you know, or rather useful uh, uh, bands because of this this feature and the details of it you can read through a little bit more uh, the idea is uh, you get this four level lasing but then what happens typically is you, you get into one of the problems is this is what's called a singlet state where the optical transition is very highly favored but it can get into this triplet state where you know it, this net spin is basically of the molecule is is non zero and and then you know that is a dark state it doesn't emit light it gets stuck there so you want to keep it out of the triplet state and luckily what happens is this takes quite a bit longer than this but if you leave it long enough it will go and lock in there so what you do is you kind of continuously flow the dye in a liquid so there you put it in a liquid and you continuously flow it so it you know you kind of extract the light out and then you let it go and use another fresh batch you know so, so it's a continuous flow sort of feature to use the dye laser <laughs> uh, okay so uh, uh, there was a question I think I no? Okay. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. So, uh, what exactly are those bold kind of things? Uh -huh. Okay, so this one? Yeah. Okay, so uh, these are typically called the coordination uh, configuration coordinate diagrams, and, and uh, um, it, it is some sort of a state variable. Let, let me say here it's a distance, uh, uh, and, and um, um, let's see. So, you can imagine that uh, the minimum here, uh, one of the ways to look at it, not necessarily for this particular molecule, would be, you know, if the molecule was on the whole moving by itself. Let's say it's, you know, the molecule is sitting inside a parabolic well or something, and it, it goes to the right or to the left. It's in a, it's in a box, and then its, its energy goes back and forth. But as it's doing, it's also vibrating and all that. So if it's here it can be vibrating very lightly and it be here vibrating very fast and it could be there you know so that's the meaning of this picture really physically uh, and that can come in many ways you know it, it just does uh, yeah here uh, it's a configuration coordinate picture so, yeah. okay uh, uh, exactly in the same way but not in a big molecule but inside a crystal this is uh, something uh, with uh, I think you discussed with Professor Rana that uh, it's a Thai sapphire laser where you put a titanium atom inside uh, a sapphire crystal, L2O3, aluminum oxide crystal. And if you now look at the energies of the electron for the tie atom sitting in this whole you know, cage of surrounded by other, other atoms, it, it looks like this. Again, you have that little manifold, uh, uh, rather, you know, you have the energies uh, depending upon where that atom is. Physically here, Q is where is that atom? Is it moving? If you displace it from the center, that's, that's the energy minimum of you know, one say the S state, I don't, one of the orbitals, T2G for example, this, this energy level is here, this second one is there. If you start displacing it, it starts vibrating, then its energy is, the ground states go like that, but on top of that it has, you know, some other excitations that uh, give it that little band. And as a result, you have a broadband absorption, broadband emission, and you get this broadband behavior. So for the tie sapphire as well. These are the physical reasons why this, this actually works. So, uh, and, and once you have the broadband, you, uh, I think the way you select out a certain, if you in, do not want to mode lock, if you want to select out one particular mode, you just want a single mode laser, then uh, I think also in your problem one of the current assignment you have a thing, and you know, how do you do that? You can put an etalon inside by changing its angle here. You can select one mode or the other or the other based on the optical path length here and all that sort of thing. You know. uh, so so uh, these are the techniques to, if you want a single mode out of a broadband laser, but then obviously the broadband laser is useful for mode locking and getting higher powers and all that. You know. uh, uh, one of the most uh, 
you know, efficient gas-based lasers is the CO2 laser, carbon dioxide laser. And uh, I think there are quite a couple, at least in Duffield Hall, I know. Uh, and uh, this is uh, where, uh, first of all, I mean, this, uh, this laser can produce enormous amounts of energy. And it is probably the most efficient uh, uh, gas laser. Uh, its, its efficiency runs in typically tens of percents, meaning it could be 20%, 30%, whereas most of the other ones we talked about are much lower, 1% you know, or something like that. And meaning power in, divide, uh, power out divided by power in. How much laser output do you get divided by how much energy you're pumping in? Uh, wall plug sort of efficiency. Semiconductor lasers can run into 60, 70%. I mean, they are really very, very efficient, you know, and we'll talk about them starting next class. Uh, so uh, this is a CO2 laser. Here, the idea, again, you have a whole range of vibrational symmetric stretch, bends, and all kinds of, uh, uh, yeah, uh, you know, asymmetric stretch. And you have all these energy levels uh, uh, based on, you know, some of the modes, uh, how many, uh, how far you stretch, and all that sort of thing. And uh, so you can excite here if you transition from this stretch to that stretch. You know, you're kind of going from one vibrational mode to another. Then you, you are going to emit 10.4 micron wavelength. If you go from here to here, for example, from this mode to that mode, you're going to emit 9.4, for example. So these are the most popular emission wavelengths for CO2 lasers. And as we have used it, you would know. Uh, and, and the way you excite it is you come in with an electron uh, and you uh, essentially, um, under, when it's not vibrating, you're kind of here, so you're actually pumping in a lot of electrons, and electron collides and essentially imparts it this vibrational energy, and then you know, and you put it in a cavity with, with the right uh, cavity size, and you can get these wavelengths out. And the main thing here is the power you get out is huge, and uh, uh, the efficiency, surprisingly, is very high, and uh, therefore it's used for you know, cutting, laser cutting through you know, centimeters of steel and all that you can cut through using, using this laser. So that's kind of nice, a really nice application of a, uh, and it uses this sort of a manifold as well. Is what I'm thinking of. Okay, so actually let's uh, end it here. I wanted to, a couple of small topics, excimers and free electrons, we'll cover that in the next class before we get started on the semiconductor laser. So, all right, see you on Monday then.